Hi, dissidents. Anastasia Bowden here. Sorry I can't join you for the next three episodes. I'm on maternity leave, but we do have three fantastic guest hosts to fill in for me. I hope you enjoy. The federal government is brimming with hundreds of agencies and millions of employees, many of whom enjoy some measure of independence from political accountability. But the president is supposed to be responsible for everything that happens in his branch of government. With the creation of more and more independent agencies, the lines of accountability have become blurred. But in a series of cases, the Supreme Court has required clear lines of accountability so that the buck stops with the president. I'm Elizabeth Slattery, and this week on DIST, we're looking at United States versus Arthrax. The court's decision is indefensible. I respectfully dissent. Because the majority in this case has not done what a court of law must do, I respectfully dissent. For these reasons and others elaborated, in my opinion, I respectfully dissent. We respectfully dissent. I respectfully dissent. I respectfully dissent. I dissent. Early progressives sought to centralize power in government agencies that they thought could efficiently and effectively manage society based on their expert knowledge. The Constitution's separation of powers and system of checks and balances are supposed to prevent this centralization of power. But starting in the early 20th century, Congress sought to insulate the experts from politics by creating independent agencies that operated with limited oversight by the president, even to the point of restricting his ability to hire, fire, and otherwise direct the work of agency bureaucrats. Today, there are so many federal agencies, even the government can't settle on a precise number. Dissidents, I know you're probably wondering who that was just then. Let me introduce my colleague, Ethan Blevins. He's a legal fellow at PLF, working primarily on property rights and equality and opportunity issues. He previously worked as a litigator, mostly suing his favorite defendant, the city of Seattle. He earned a nickname from the Seattle Times as the sharpest pin around to the council's liberal bubble. But as Ethan was saying... FOIA.gov, which provides advice on how to request public information, says there are over 100 agencies. Regulations.gov, a website run by the General Services Administration, notes there are more than 260 agencies, and that's only including ones that provide information to the site about their rulemaking process. The Federal Register lists 434 federal agencies. In short, there are a lot. And they're brimming with more than 4 million federal bureaucrats, many of whom enjoy some measure of independence from political accountability. A little bit independent in your walk. A little bit independent in your talk. Independence can be a desirable goal. In the Declaration of Independence, after all, the 13 colonies affirmed their personal freedom, assumed responsibility for self-government, rejected the tyrannical rule of King George III, and proclaimed their right to be free and independent states. But when it comes to government, free and independent translates to a lack of accountability to the American people. The last episode explained how Congress has increasingly delegated its lawmaking power to federal agencies with the Supreme Court's blessing. In this episode, we'll look at how the growth of the administrative state has led to less accountability for government, even as bureaucrats become more entwined in our lives seeking to regulate us from cradle to grave. So where do we begin? With the Constitution, of course. The framers knew that the president couldn't run the executive branch alone and would need a staff to manage it. And the debates at the Constitutional Convention make clear that the framers wanted to ensure the president was responsible and accountable for the actions of his staff. So they carefully crafted several constitutional provisions to ensure this accountability to the people. For example, Article 2, Section 1 of the Constitution explains that all executive power is vested in the president alone. In other words, the buck stops here. The buck stops here. The buck stops with me. And the buck stops with me. To reinforce this constitutional grant of authority, all officers of the United States must be appointed in a way that guarantees their accountability to the president and ultimately to the people. Article 2, Section 2 states that the president shall nominate and by and with the advice and consent of the Senate shall appoint ambassadors, other public ministers and consuls, judges of the Supreme Court, and all other officers of the United States. Why was Senate confirmation necessary? Here's some background from Tommy Berry, a research fellow at the Cato Institute. 
The appointments clause came out of a debate at the constitutional convention and like many constitutional provisions, it came out of a compromise. Uh, One faction thought the president alone should have the authority to appoint judges unilaterally and officers in the in the executive branch on the theory that responsibility, the ability to act quickly, these were things uh, kind of inherent and appropriate to, to one single person making the selection. Another faction was worried about essentially cronyism, that the president would appoint his pals, uh, unqualified friends or family members, and that there would be nothing uh, the populace could do. They thought that some larger body Body, either a committee or maybe the, the Senate acting as a whole uh, should select them. Uh, so these two factions debated for a while, and eventually they reached a compromise where the president would nominate candidates for both judges and executive branch officers, but a nomination wouldn't be enough for them to take office. The Senate would then have to provide advice and consent. And so after a majority vote in the Senate, they would then be appointed. And as Governor Morris put it, uh, he said that as the president would nominate, there would be responsibility. But then as the Senate would evaluate those nominations, there would be security. In other words, it would be a check against cronyism. As Alexander Hamilton put it in Federalist 76, he thought it would go a long way towards uh, preventing the appointment of unfit characters. The framers provided an alternative to presidential appointment and Senate confirmation. Article 2, Section 2 states that the Congress may by law vest the appointment of such inferior officers as they think proper in the president alone, in the courts of law, or in the heads of departments. Traveling back to the Constitutional Convention, Tommy summed it up. This is a second distinction that arose from text added on the very last day of the Constitutional Convention. As I said, there was this compromise that the president would nominate officers, but the Senate would have to confirm them. And this was how the clause stood without any exception up until the last day, until our favorite framer, Governor Morris, said, wait a minute, I think we should have some sort of exception for inferior officers. And so this clause was added that said Congress may by law provide for the appointment of inferior officers by the president alone, the head of a department or a court of law. In other words, cutting out the Senate from this process. So we really don't have any a contemporaneous record of why this was added. Um, But the Supreme Court has, in a few cases, uh, said that essentially it was clearly for the purposes of convenience, that as the federal government got bigger and bigger, there might be too many offices really for the Senate to have the time or for it to be important enough for them to review every single one. According to Chris Walker, a professor at the University of Michigan Law School, the appointments clause was all about And it's a matter of political accountability when it comes to at least officers in the United States that are exercising executive authority, that there should be some type of elections matter story. So either at least the president's playing a role, um, sometimes if they're really important officers or the Senate otherwise wants them to be controlled more by Congress, then then the Senate plays a confirmation role. But the idea is, is, is political accountability. And on the flip side, the idea is also those a check on patronage. You don't want to have presidents just bring in whoever they want. Um, just to kind of reward them for supporting them during the election. You want them to bring in qualified people, which is one reason why you have that kind of default of if you're an officer of the United States, unless Congress is otherwise, you've got to get Senate confirmed. So there are presidentially appointed and Senate confirmed officers, a.k.a. principal officers, and inferior officers. But looking at the earliest executive branch departments, there were other employees who weren't considered officers. Chris observed that the Constitution... It doesn't say anything about employees, and the Supreme Court for centuries has read into the Constitution the idea that can also be employees of the government that aren't inferior officers or any officers at all. And that's been where a lot of the litigation and attention has been at the Supreme Court over the last decade is who's an employee versus an officer. So who are officers of the United States? Here's Tommy. So I could give you a a more than a hundred page answer to that question. But the much shorter version is that the Supreme Court has never given that great uh, an answer. There are many cases that have slowly built up a doctrine in the early period in the 1800s. The first case raising this issue was United States versus Maurice in 1823. It's an opinion by Chief Justice John Marshall, not for the Supreme Court, but for the District of Virginia while he was writing circuit. It involved an agent of fortifications who was charged with embezzlement. As Tommy was saying, and he had essentially agreed to a bond where if he violated his oath of office, he had to pay the government twenty thousand dollars. 
But Maurice, the clever embezzler, said, aha, I found a loophole. The bond says that I have this duty as an officer of the United States, and I wasn't uh, appointed as an officer, or I didn't didn't actually hold an office. So you can't, can't get this bond from me, even if I did embezzle. So Chief Justice Marshall goes through a lengthy discussion, essentially saying, yes, there was no statute uh, officially creating this office, and it doesn't seem to have tenure or continuity, so it probably wasn't an office. But then at the end, he says, but that shouldn't be able to get him out of being on the hook for this money. So he has to pay anyway. The next few decades, Supreme Court cases implicating officers mostly dealt with situations like Maurice's, where an individual committed a crime and part of the definition of the crime was holding an office. The defendant would argue he hadn't been appointed as an officer, so the crime didn't apply to him. The touchstone for whether someone was an officer or not was whether they occupied a continuing government position. There also have been disputes over whether Congress may insulate officers from being fired. In Myers v. United States, a first-class postmaster who was dismissed by President Woodrow Wilson before his term was up sued for back pay. The Supreme Court held that the power to remove executive officers was essential to the president's ability to carry out the law. You're fired. And that opinion was written by none other than Chief Justice and former president William Howard Taft. Less than 10 years later, the court had a change of heart. Here's what happened. William Humphrey was appointed to a six-year term on the Federal Trade Commission by President Herbert Hoover. Two years later, there was a new president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and he didn't see eye to eye with Humphrey. Roosevelt fired Humphrey, but Humphrey kept on working and sued for his pay. The case was Humphrey's executor versus United States, so named because Humphrey died while the case was pending and his estate took over the claim for his wages. The Supreme Court unanimously upheld the limits Congress placed on the president's ability to fire FTC commissioners. The court explained that it was necessary to protect the FTC, which it styled a quasi-legislative, quasi-judicial body, from the president's control and coercive influence. A little bit independent with your smile. A little bit independent in your style. This ruling legitimized the argument for independence for some federal bureaucrats and paved the way for the rapid growth of the administrative state. In 1976, the Supreme Court decided the landmark campaign finance case, Buckley v. Vallejo. Buried in hundreds of pages of that ruling was an important separation of powers issue. Did Congress's appointment of federal election commissioners violate the Constitution? The Supreme Court said yes, because only officers of the United States who were responsible to the president could wield significant government authority under the laws. About a decade later, the court heard Morrison v. Olson a case challenging Congress's creation of an independent counsel who was appointed by a special court authorized to investigate and prosecute government officials and who the statute provided could not be removed except for cause. Up until this point, the court hadn't squarely addressed the line between principal and inferior officers. The majority concluded that it need not attempt to decide exactly where the line falls because the independent counsel clearly falls on the inferior officer side of that line. As Tommy explained... The majority said yes on sort of a multi-factor balancing test approach that the special counsel could be removed from cause, had a limited tenure, was sort of appointed for just one task, and so on. Justice Scalia, in a solo dissent, said no, all of these factors aren't really relevant. The key point is that the special counsel can only be removed for cause and has quite a bit of independence by design, and so is not functionally subordinate to anyone let alone the attorney general. And that's a problem because if inferior, Justice Scalia argued at the framing, simply meant subordinate to, essentially you have a superior who can direct you and who can reverse you if necessary, or who can remove you from office if they don't like what you're doing. And as with Humphrey's executor and the FTC, the court declined to second guess Congress's decision to limit the independent counsel's ability to be fired. Restricting the ability of the attorney general, who nominally was the independent counsel's supervisor, to fire her was, quote, essential in the view of Congress to establish the necessary independence of that office. A little bit independent with your smile. 
The court revisited the issue of the line between principal and inferior officers nine years later. This case was Edmund versus United States. Here's what happened. Justice Scalia wrote the majority. This concerned judges within the Coast Guard system and whether they were inferior principal officers. The majority opinion held that they were inferior, but the reasoning of the opinion was much more in this formalistic inferior means subordinate mode, almost echoing beat for beat Justice Scalia's dissent in Morrison versus Olson. And so he went through the fact that they were removable at will, that they did not have the power to give the final word for the executive branch uh, without uh, some level of review by a superior. And he said that those factors, most importantly, in addition to some other supervision and oversight by superiors, was what made them inferior officers. Now, Edmund didn't explicitly overrule Morrison or Eaton or these other cases, but it certainly seemed to shift much more to a formalistic approach. And lower courts have taken Edmund to be the guiding rule ever since. To recap the court's jurisprudence, Officers are those who exercise significant government authority in a continuing office established by law. They must be presidentially appointed and Senate confirmed, unless Congress vests their appointment in the president alone, department heads, or, less often, with courts of law. And whether officers are principal or inferior depends on their supervision, removability, and ability to issue final decisions. Citing Buckley, the court held in Freitag v. Commission in 1991 and Lucia v. SEC in 2018 that special trial judges on the U.S. Tax Court and the SEC's administrative law judges are officers and not mere employees. And citing Edmund, the court invalidated double four-cause removal protections for inferior officers who make up the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board in Free Enterprise Fund versus PCAOB in 2010. The court also clarified in Sela Law versus CFPB in 2020 and Collins versus Yellen in 2021 that Congress may not insulate principal officers who head independent agencies from presidential control. Otherwise, as Chief Justice Roberts wrote, the president could not be held fully accountable for discharging his own responsibilities. The buck would stop somewhere else. That brings us to United States versus Arthrex. The issue was whether administrative patent judges are principal or inferior officers. As Chris explained, when it comes to agency adjudicators, like administrative law judges, immigration judges, here administrative patent judges, for a long time, we thought they were just employees and not even officers. Um, and the argument would go, you know, that ultimately they're, they're, not exercising like normal executive power, they're adjudicating, like they're doing something a little bit different. And we definitely think they should be insulated from politics to at least a certain degree. If you think about the Administrative Procedure Act, it was trying to strike this balance where the adjudication was done at the hearing level, the trial level by this almost like tenure protected judge. It was hired based on merit, could only be fired based on merit. And you get a clean record and you get like law applied to facts and politics wouldn't play a role. And then it would go up to the agency head and the agency head could then institute the policy making preferences of the president or the administration or that agency head. And so you still have like politically accountable adjudication. Congress revamped the patent system with the passage of the America Invents Act of 2011, which led to... To get this kind of weird quirk that you have at the patent office, which is that these administrative patent judges that we understand as inferior officers, Congress decided to give them final decision-making authority. In other words, the head of the agency doesn't get the final say, like they do in kind of the normal Administrative Procedure Act model. And they may have done this for a number of different reasons. I think one main reason that Congress may have done this, and I say may... I don't think the record's that clear, but I think I kind of intuit what's going on, is that they wanted these decisions to be insulated from politics. Uh, they didn't want a president to be able to appoint a head of the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office that would have a particular political or policy angle and would impose that on, on these proceedings. So this is one of those tricky, when it comes to agency adjudication, and what I always kind of say, these are the constitutional tensions, all right? With that background in mind, let's dig into the Arthrex case. Arthrex owned a patent related to a knotless suture-securing assembly. It sued Smith & Nephew, Inc., 
for patent infringement in federal court in 2015. The parties settled out of court, and then Smith and Nephew asked the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office to review Arthrex's patent. Here's Tommy with the details. This dispute went to a Patent and Trademark Office procedure or process called inter partes review, which is essentially a process for patents to be challenged if someone believes that it was given an error. So the process for inter partes review is that a panel of three administrative patent judges or APJs uh, review this challenge and apply the pet law of patents and decide whether the patent uh, should be withdrawn. And in this case, they decided, yes, uh, the patent should be withdrawn. So Arthrex lost before this panel. And when you lose before a panel, you can ask the panel itself to review it, but there's no other means of appeal within the executive branch. The only appeal process is to the judicial branch, to the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. So Arthrex did appeal to the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. They appealed on the merits of their, their patent, but they also brought a constitutional challenge, an appointments clause challenge. They had a problem with the APJs having this last word, this this ability to take away their patent without review. And the APJs are appointed by the Secretary of Commerce. They're not appointed by the president with Senate consent. So it's only constitutional if APJs are inferior. But what Arthrex argued is they are not inferior under the Edmund test because they have the last word for the executive branch. So unlike the judges in the Coast Guard in Edmund, whose decisions could be reviewed, APJ decisions can't be reviewed. The appeals court held that APJs are principal officers because their decisions are not subject to review by a presidentially appointed officer, their work is not supervised by a presidentially appointed officer, and they may be removed from office only for such cause as will promote the efficiency of the service. Since they were not appointed consistent with the Constitution, the, quote, narrowest viable approach, the court concluded, was severing the statutory removal restriction from the law authorizing their appointment and declaring them inferior officers. All of the parties, Arthrex, Smith and & Nephew, and the federal government were unhappy with this ruling. So the case went up to the Supreme Court. We will hear argument this morning in case 191434, United States versus Arthrex Incorporated and the Consolidated Cases. The argument took place in March 2021 during the era of argument by telephone. Malcolm Stewart, who was Deputy Solicitor General, began explaining all the ways the director of the Patent and Trademark Office supervised APJs, which made them inferior officers. Here's an exchange between Chief Justice Roberts and Malcolm Stewart. Uh, Mr. Stewart, that was a long list of things that the director can do. Um, But, of course, the one thing that he can't do is just change the decision of the APJ. And so it is sort of the directly opposite to what the appointments clause was designed to do, which is transparency and make it clear who's responsible. Here, you know, the the director can pressure the APJ, uh, but at the end of the day, he can say, well, that's not my fault. Well, I think what the court said in Edmund was that the mark of an inferior officer is that the uh, inferior has a superior and is supervised at some level by executive branch officials who are appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate. And we don't have a bright line test for this. But the court in Edmund said the fact that the Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces can't second guess the factual determinations of the lower court it is not sufficient to make those lower court judges principal officers. Speaking of Edmund, here's Justice Sotomayor. For my colleagues, and there are some who don't like um, amorphous concepts or ones that don't have um, a, a, a yardstick by which to measure, what is the advantage of us keeping the Edmonds test? I think the advantage is that the government is so multifarious. There's such an enormous number of officers and employees within the executive branch, that any attempt to to formulate a bright line test would almost inevitably lead to anomalous results in some category categories of cases. Even in 1787, the framers were concerned that it would be administratively inconvenient to require Senate confirmation for all officers. And since that time, the executive branch has grown enormously, but there's still just one president and there's still just one Senate. Naturally, convenience and efficiency are high priorities for a regulator. But Justice Gorsuch wanted to know about supervision. As he put it, 
Last term, the court in SELA law said that executive officials must always remain subject to the ongoing supervision and control of the elected president. Through the president's oversight, the chain of dependence is preserved so that lo- the lowest officers, the middle grade, and the highest all depend as they ought on the president and the president on the community. Uh, I- I'm struggling to uh, understand how uh, that interpretation of our Constitution squares with your argument that not even the President of the United States, either himself or through his subordinates, can reverse a decision of uh, APJs. Wh- where's the chain of dependence? Well, the, the President obviously appoints the director subject to Senate confirmation, and the director can be removed by the President. The director I understand the removal, but I, my, my question was focused on the supervision and control language in, in SELA law. Well, the, the, the president can issue kind of instructions to the director and can terminate the director if the, the director doesn't uh, comply. The director has various supervisory mechanisms. Again, that's removal. And my question was focused on supervision. If the president disagrees with the decision or one of his uh, designees down the chain of dependence disagrees with the decision, there's no remedy that, that the president has, correct? Well, there there is a perspective remedy in the sense that the uh, I'm talking about the decision. I'm not talking about removal. No, there is a there is a right of appeals to the the federal circuit, but I think the that's, same thing. That's a separate branch of government. I'm, I'm again. I'm talking within the executive branch, Mr. Stewart. There's there's no chain of dependence running to the president with respect to the supervision of a particular decision. Is there? Indeed, there wasn't. And Justice Kavanaugh put a finer point on the problem. And the lack of accountability, as the Chief Justice said, and Justice Gorsuch was just saying, these are multi-million, sometimes billion-dollar decisions being made not by someone uh, who's accountable in the usual way that the Appointments Clause uh, demands. Jeffrey Lampkin, the attorney for Arthrex, had some thoughts on the notion that there's still accountability in this system. For the public and agreed parties wanting to know who to hold accountable for the decision, there's just nobody. The principal officer's response is, I have no authority to overturn those bad decisions. Congress stripped me of that power. That's the opposite of accountability. It's the nature of adjudication that you decide individual cases. If we're going to have accountability in adjudication, it has to be accountability for individual cases. Structural protections like these protect individual liberty. So they have to apply in individual cases. In a 5-4 ruling, the majority agreed with Arthrex that APJ's ability to issue final decisions on the cancellation of patents is a power that's inconsistent with their appointment as inferior officers. Chief Justice Roberts explained that, quote, In every respect, save the insulation of their decisions from review, APJs appear to be inferior officers, end quote. But this power is too great for an inferior officer to wield, Chief Justice Roberts reasoned, so the director of the patent office, a principal officer, must have the ability to change an APJ's decision to cancel a patent. This way, the buck stops with an officer who is more politically accountable to the public. Roberts explained that the exercise of government power, quote, acquires its legitimacy and accountability to the public through a clear and effective chain of command down from the president on whom all the people vote, end quote. Empowering APJs to make final decisions that were not subject to review by a principal officer inverted the chain of command. In the majority's view, only a presidentially appointed and Senate-confirmed officer may exercise this level of government power over private parties. And how did the court fix this problem? Chris described Chief Justice Roberts' solution. He agrees with the Federal Circuit and says there's not enough control to make them inferior officers. And to fix that as a constitutional matter, I'm going to sever the part of the statute that doesn't allow for agency head review. In other words, I'm going to allow them to go forward, but now there's agency head review, and that fixes the constitutional problem. Justices Alito, Kavanaugh, and Barrett joined the majority in full. Justice Gorsuch agreed on the constitutional question, but parted ways with Robert's choice of a remedy. Here's Tommy. There were three 
key options for what remedy might be used to to fix this constitutional problem. The lower court, the Court of Appeals, had said we're going to make them removable. They thought that that was sort of what Edmund put the most weight on. Chief Justice Roberts, writing for a four-justice plurality, said, no, we're not going to focus on removability. We're going to focus on reviewability. So we're just going to adjust the statute slightly and remove the one portion of the statute that makes their decisions unreviewable by the director alone. And we're going to say that for every decision of a three-judge panel of APJs, the director has the option, if he wants, to review that decision and potentially overrule it, and that that will make them functionally and formally subordinate to the director. Chris summed it up. I mean, Justice Gorsuch was like, in his you know separate opinion, hey, like this, I agree it's unconstitutional. Let's just declare it unconstitutional and let Congress fix it. Justice Gorsuch expressed skepticism about the majority's approach, writing, quote, Short of summoning ghosts and spirits, how are we to know what those in a past Congress might think about a question they never expressed any view on and may have never foreseen? Let's be honest, too. These legislative seances usually wind up producing only the results intended by those conducting the performance. The crystal ball ends up being more of a mirror. And why didn't the majority take the approach suggested by Justice Gorsuch? Chris had some thoughts on that. And Roberts knew, well, one, what happens? That's like massive chaos at the agency. The system basically is unconstitutional until, you know, it couldn't do anything unless Congress came back and fixed it. And while we're used to hearing about gridlock in Congress, Chris pointed out. So even put aside all the kind of arguments, oh, there's dysfunction. They don't look. You know, no, on things like this, you do get bipartisan agreement to fix things. Republicans and Democrats really care about this patent system. Turning to the next partial dissent, partial concurrence, Justice Breyer, joined by Justices Sotomayor and Kagan, disagreed with the majority on the officer issue, but agreed with the majority's remedy. Breyer wrote, The nation's desires and needs change, sometimes over long periods of time. In the 19th century, the judiciary may not have foreseen the changes that produced the New Deal, along with its accompanying changes in the nature of the tasks that government was expected to perform. We may not now easily foresee just what kinds of tasks present or future technological changes will call for. He continued, The founders wrote a constitution that they believed was flexible enough to respond to new needs as those needs developed and changed over the course of decades or centuries. At the same time, they designed a constitution that would protect certain basic principles— a principle that prevents Congress from affording inferior-level adjudicators some decision-making independence was not among them. From Chris's perspective, the upshot of Breyer's dissent was... It sent a message to Congress, and this is what Breyer was really trying to get through in his dissent, that you don't have the room to innovate around the Constitution. That if you want to try to set up an adjudication system that better insulates decision-making from politics, you don't have that option. You've got to keep them in Article Three courts. And Congress set up the system in the first place because Article Three courts were way too expensive. They took way too long. And there was a lot of form shopping to get these all in one district in Texas where, you know. And so Congress was like, we want to stop that. We want to create a much more accessible way for people to challenge bad patents quickly and have them decided by experts. And last but not least, there's Justice Thomas's dissent. Justices Breyer, Sotomayor, and Kagan joined in part. Talk about strange bedfellows. Thomas wrote that the Constitution doesn't distinguish inferior officer power from principal officer power. So the method of appointment tells us what kind of officer they are. Since administrative patent judges were appointed consistent with the Constitution's requirement for inferior officers, that should have ended the case. Justice Thomas warned against, quote, staring deeply into the penumbras of the Constitution's clauses to identify new structural limitations, end quote. As Tommy put it, Justice Thomas uh, raises some skepticism about whether the text can really bear uh, all that weight to kind of give it that much meaning uh, and second-guess Congress uh, if they don't give an inferior officer all of those limitations. So Justice Thomas points to the framing debates, and he points out that James Madison at one point used the word lesser as a synonym for inferior, and lesser was exactly the word that Justice Scalia put in Edmund said they had not chosen intentionally because inferior meant subordinate, whereas lesser could simply mean lower in rank, but not necessarily subordinate. And so Justice Thomas says, aha, if James Madison was using these synonymously, maybe we shouldn't put any weight on the fact that they chose inferior versus lesser. Maybe they just weren't putting a lot of thought into that and they just picked the first word that came to them. 
Justice Thomas concluded his dissent with a call to action. The court today draws a new line dividing inferior officers from principal ones. The fact that this line places administrative patent judges on the side of ambassadors, Supreme Court justices, and department heads suggests that something is not quite right. At some point, we should take stock of our precedent to see if it aligns with the Appointments Clause's original meaning. So that would seem to end the matter, right? Not so fast, as Tommy explained. Arthrex takes all this effort to get it all the way up to the Supreme Court, and it seems like they get a complete victory. They have this ruling that, yes, the APJ decision can be reviewed, and it has to be reviewed by a a superior officer, someone confirmed by the Senate. Yet, when it goes back down, it's not reviewed by someone confirmed by the Senate who is superior to the APJs. So why is that? Because the PTO director, the position that the Supreme Court had granted this newfound reviewing power to was vacant. Right when the Biden administration took power, the PTO director from the Trump administration resigned. uh, So there was no Senate confirmed person in the office. And the Biden administration did not even use the Vacancies Act, the statute that is supposed to be used uh, to fill unexpected vacancies, uh, such as the ones that arise at the beginning of an administration. With the PTO director and deputy director positions vacant, the director's power had been delegated to the commissioner for patents, an inferior officer, who denied review of the ruling that invalidated Arthrex's patent. Arthrex argues this contradicts the Supreme Court's ruling in its case because it is entitled to review by a principal officer, and Arthrex recently asked the Supreme Court to hear its case again. The court could announce this spring if it will do so. President Harry Truman's slogan, The Buck Stops Here, embodies the idea that the president is personally responsible for overseeing the executive branch. But even give him hell Harry bemoaned, I thought I was the president, but when it comes to these bureaucrats, I can't do a damn thing. While proponents of the administrative state say insulating bureaucrats takes the politics out of policymaking, in reality, it takes the American people out of policymaking. With a federal bureaucracy that is ballooned in size, four million and growing, Clear lines of supervision and accountability are all the more essential. Thanks for listening to DIST. Please subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. We'd appreciate your feedback, so send questions, comments, or ideas for future episodes to dist at pacificlegal.org. And if you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a five-star rating and tell your friends to check out DIST. So you're just doing cases Anastasia doesn't care about while she's on? <laughs> she doesn't care about separation of powers? Wow, look at those bobbleheads. Yeah. <laughs> Quite a collection. It's something. I'm so. NPR voice. Yeah. Calm you down. AS- ASMR, appointments clause doctrine. <laughs> to go to sleep. Justice Breyer, joined by Justices Sotomayor. Sorry, after all these years, I still stumble over her name. Sotomayor. (laughs) (laughs) That's not maybe as interesting for PLF listeners. It is for like, if we're doing administrative law, like geek podcast or something, but. (laughs) Okay. I'm going to be reporting this to your boss. She's on maternity leave. So. It's not stopping her from sending me messages. (laughs) This reminded me of why I didn't become a doctor, which is I get very squeamish, even, even at the most general description of anything surgery related. (laughs) 